Sure, my name is Christian Raffensperger. I'm a professor and chair of history at Wittenberg University. Um, and we're going to talk about Mikhailo Khrushchevsky's History of Ukraine, Rus, Volume 2, the English translation, which is just out. Oh boy, it's a massive project that has gone on for a long time. Yeah, Frank Sisson, of course, is the mastermind behind all of this at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. Um, and he has been doing this translation project with a whole team of people for 20 years now. And they started with book one uh, of Hrushevsky's massive 10 volume uh, project, which is coming out in 12 volumes in English. And then they went to later stuff and are working their way back. So um, I was an editorial consultant on volume three and then an editor on volume two, which really gets into my period in the 11th and 12th century. I've known Frank uh, through conferences uh, for a number of years, but actually about six, seven years ago, I was on sabbatical and had a grant at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, um, a Shklar Fellowship, and they had a conference there uh, about the Kovadis Ukraine uh, that Serhiy Ploki organized. And uh, a couple of the speakers were very kind enough to mention my Reimagining Europe, about which you and I talked uh, a number of years ago now. And um, Frank approached me about being a consultant on volume three and then ended up doing editing work on volume two. Um, and that's just been in process then for, for the last six years, doing bits and pieces of it, uh, writing um, extra bits to the introduction uh, and then uh, editorial notes and reading all of the text. Uh, so, yeah. What Hrushevsky set out to do in the, the whole thing was do a history of, and he, he had this paraphrase, uh, or uh, hyphenate, right, Ukrainian Rus. Um, and so he wanted to connect Rus into um, his modern Ukrainian history in the 19th and early 20th century. Um, books one, two, and three of that massive series deal with medieval Rus. Um, so this is how I got involved, of course. And so book two really deals with the 11th and 12th century. And one of the things that Khrushchevsky did that is still uh, relevant today, so much so, in fact, I just wrote an article about this, um, is he wrote a history of medieval Rus that integrates Rus into the larger medieval European world. And that narrative of Rus as part of medieval Europe never really caught on in medieval studies in large part because of the influence of Vasily Kluchevsky in his Russian um, short history that became a much more popular narrative. So really Khrushchevsky was taking on this whole idea that Rus was part of Russian history and it went from Kiev to uh, Vladimir Suzdal to Moscow to modern Russia. Right? And he's saying, no, that, that's not it, right? We need to look at Kiev as Kiev, right? And, and leading to that path. And, uh, Serhiy Ploki has written about Khrushchevsky and that reception of the scholarship. And Russian studies uh, scholars in uh, both Imperial and Soviet, as you note, did not care for it, um, did not like it. There was a sub, um, a, a, an element, let's just say an element of scholars who did read it and who were interested. And it made an impact in the larger world in large part because volume one was translated into German. Um, and Hrushevsky was very clear. He wanted to write in Ukrainian. He wanted to write in his mother tongue. And he recognized that this was going to be limiting in some ways. But volume one was translated into German. And in fact, you can see that it becomes cited in larger European discussions of medieval history, but only in that context. And volume one ends with the death of Volodymyr Svetoslavich, the Christianizer. And so that is where that contribution kind of ends. And so um, you can see that larger world impact, but, but, but not for what happens in volumes two and volumes three and going forward. Boy, he was brilliant. And he read not only the Russian primary sources, he read the sources in Greek and the sources in Latin. He read the sources in Old Norse. Um, he read all of the medieval, uh, medieval sources so that he could create a synthesis. And so, you know, when I sat down to write Reimagining Europe, uh, first as, as a dissertation at the University of Chicago, um, I thought I, I'm startled that there is so much material about Rus' 
in the primary sources in Latin that never makes it into the scholarship on Rus, which is largely a Russian studies field of scholarship. Um, it wasn't until later on that I discovered Hrushevsky, and this is of course my own bibliographic ignorance, um, and saw that he was doing a hundred years ago uh, things that I thought I was innovating of trying to utilize Latin sources to talk about a wider picture of Rus. And, and I firmly believe that, that his narrative is still, still a hundred years later, one of the best narratives about medieval Rusian history uh, today. He starts out um, after the death of Vladimir Sviatoslavich. So he starts out with um, the succession to Yaroslav and the troubled succession to Yaroslav. And then volume two deals with that progression towards um, the narrative. The traditional narrative is one of centralization under Yaroslav. Um, Izyaslav Yaroslavich, his son, um, has some problems and is cast out twice, the second time by his uh, brothers. And in fact, Ruszewski goes into great detail to talk about that and he talks about how Izyaslav and his family went to Poland and they went to the German Empire. They ended up seeking help from the papacy. So he narrates all of that. He talks about uh, the end of the uh, 11th century. He talks about the family conferences that are held to try and bring Rus back together. Um, and then he talks about the difficult kind of separation as the, the various territories go their own way in the 12th century. So um, he is trying to pr present a, I think, more complex but more accurate depiction than you'll get in what's often called the traditional narrative of uh, Kiev and Russian history, which is a Russian narrative. Um, I wrote a book, Conflict, Bargaining, and Kinship Networks, to try and show that the 12th century wasn't just a period of, um, you know, fractious internecine conflict. And uh, I know Fyodor uh, Uspensky in Moscow and Anna Litvina um, are working on a similar 12th century project solely about Rus, saying that this wasn't the falling apart that is traditionally described. But yes, the reign of Yaroslav Mudri is often seen as the golden age uh, of Rus. They did send me um, a PDFs of the Ukrainian version so that I would have it um, for exactly that purpose. And the translators largely uh, did their jobs um, separate from me. They were excellent. Um, but I did have some issues um, just with my own translational peculiarities. So for instance, um, I wrote a book, Kingdom of Rus, um, where I talk about how Kenya should be translated as king uh, rather than prince. Right, and so I have some interest in how that um, translation issue works. Similarly, um, if we're talking about words that translate as governor as opposed to mayor, right? So we get into that a little bit. Um, the translation that I ended up doing was not the Ukrainian translation, but um, the translation for Latin. Because when Hrushevsky wrote this, it was an era of scholarship in which if you were a practiced medieval scholar, you wrote um, your translations, uh, or you didn't write your translations, right? You, you just included the Latin or you included the Greek. Um, and if the person reading your book was also an academic, they would also, of course, read those languages. But this is a comprehensive translation, and so they had to translate pieces into uh, the Latin into English as well as the Ukrainian into English. Also, Khrushchevsky was so well read in the sources that he would often include bits from the, the chronicles that he remembered. Um, and so there are many times that I read those bits and said, okay, this isn't actually a quote. This is a paraphrase of what's going on in the Chronicle. So that was a negotiation with the translators and other editors a little bit as well, saying that Khrushchevsky says he's quoting the Chronicle, but in fact, he's paraphrasing the Chronicle. And so that became an editorial uh, footnote in which we gave the exact text, um, but kept Khrushchevsky's paraphrase. I discovered so much, and um, if I can give a visual aid, will you bear with me for one moment? Okay. No, so, so this is Hrushevsky Volume 1, all right? There are uh, 10 volumes, uh, 12 in English, right? And so look how thick this is. And this is my Reimagining Europe, right? And it's tiny in comparison. Right. And this is one volume of three in which he deals with the medieval world.
right? So the amount of detail that he goes into is extraordinary. And he talks about localities. And I learned so much in reading, uh, close reading of volume two and three about what is happening in little areas. And he's able to describe these areas and the fortifications that are left and town names and wall names. And I, I suspect, and I, I don't know, but I suspect that he actually went to so many of these places and was able to see them. Um, and that gave him an, another level of insight into what's going on as well. Sisson uh, Frank is, is absolutely correct that he was cranking out massive amounts of material in a way that frankly books like this can't be published anymore um and and i think it's so wonderful that it's in english now because it is not just uh, for a ukrainian audience it, that was part of what mikhailo Khrushchevsky wanted but the impact of the scholarship um, can now be felt in a much wider world because it has been translated into english um uh, it's not something that i see cited very often uh, i was in a talk uh, obviously, uh, virtually, uh, a couple of days ago at the Southern Federal University, which is in Rostov on Don. Um, and I was talking about historiography issues and I brought up Khrushchevsky and they just blew past it. The other scholars who were, who were talking about things. Um, there's not a lot of engagement with it, I think, still today. Um, the only other person on this roundtable I was on who talked about medieval things um, cited B. A. Ribakov, um probably five times, um, and yet there's no mention of Khrushchevsky, who's a much better scholar, um, talking about some of the same periods. So, I mean, not that Rybakov's not, but but the in-depth nature of Khrushchevsky scholarship, as we were just talking about, um, really puts him above and beyond a lot of uh, the Russian scholars of similar periods. Yes, absolutely. Um, the whole history of Eastern Europe needs to be rewritten, and the translation of Khrushchevsky is, of course, an enormous part of that. Um, Serki Ploki's book on Khrushchevsky is called something like Unmaking Imperial Russia, and that was the goal, was to try and disrupt this traditional narrative of Russian history, and Khrushchevsky was doing that from the 10th century all the way to the 19th century. It was trying to be disruptive and, and change the way it was structured. Um, I think that if we could get Khrushchevsky's narrative, or we'll pose a counterfactual maybe more accurately, if, if Khrushchevsky's narrative had been translated more widely uh, 100 years ago when it first came out, I think we would see a very different historiography of Eastern Europe today. Um, because, and it's not just conservative scholars, scholars are inherently conservative in the sense that they rely on precedent. And so scholars will cite other authors. And so um, what you'll see time and time again is people citing other scholars for evidence that is then established, right? If there's no one to cite for something, it makes a lot of scholars nervous to kind of go out on that limb and say something, not Hrushevsky, right? Hrushevsky was, was willing to go out and say these new things. Um, but without a model, a lot of scholars are willing to or content to simply stick to what is known, what is proven, what is demonstrated, and make incremental changes. Whereas Khrushchevsky was blowing it up, right, and starting again, which is what uh, Magashi was talking about, I think. Yeah, that, and that was a difficult thing, uh, was to think about those limitations and be very aware of Khrushchevsky in his time and place when I was reading this. Because as I read, so many things assaulted my senses as a 21st century historian that we couldn't say today, we wouldn't say today. Um, he talked a lot about autochthonous culture. Uh, um, he made generalizations about groups and identity. Um, and, and those things today are just so much more nuanced. Scholars take much greater care to try and pick out little pieces um, and try and be very careful about what they're saying and not make these, these large generalizations about people. Um, that was something as I read, I had to say, well, okay, this is not a correction. I can't make a correction, right? This is Khrushchevsky in his time, in his place. Um, and so a lot of the sections about culture, which he breaks out as a separate chunk of each book, um, are sections that have not held up as well as the straight history and especially the political history, which is not always in favor in the 21st century. But 
I think his political history is some of the strongest scholarship that has stood the test of time in a way that, you know, a hundred years ago, cultural history was very different than it's done today. Social history is very different than it's done today. And so those are pieces that are of interest to modern scholars because of the way they were done a hundred years ago, less so than of interest to modern scholars as an accurate portrayal of a thousand years ago. In the periods that I work on, he got everything. Um, he knew the sources uh, in a variety of languages. He covered all of the main topics. There's nothing really that I uh, that stood out to me as something that here's a hole that he missed. Um, in fact, all kinds of things that I thought I was innovating on talking about, for instance, Izislav Yaroslavich's journey through medieval Europe. Um, you know, he had written about this. He knew the sources a uh, hundred years before I ever put pen to paper. I absolutely was giddy and I was so interested. And um, I think uh, the uh, Tanya Stitch um, was the editor I worked with a lot who would feed me chapters and then take my feet, take my comments back. Um, and I think I, I would surprise her at how quickly sometimes I would get them back because as soon as I got a new chapter, I wanted to get to it. And I wanted to get reading and find out what was in there. Um, one of the things that that kept surprising me, which which uh, you know this is like a, a confessional, uh, is that um, all of this time I was thinking, okay, I'm innovating, but Khrushchevsky did this work, and so reading this, I kept coming back and I would say to other colleagues, like, okay, you remember how I wrote about this, right? He did it. He already did that. Right. And and so it's a, a, a hole in my knowledge. Um, and I asked a scholar once, um, a Ukrainian scholar, before I was involved with this project, why has Khrushchevsky not been translated uh, into English earlier? And the scholar said to me, well, the people who need Khrushchevsky can read Khrushchevsky. And I, and I just don't think that that's true. Um, Yes, he did write with a specific purpose in mind, but in fact, his scholarship is um, uh, so good, right? Even even a hundred years later on the political stuff, that I think it's really useful. And and I really liked the way that he really mined each source to try and get all of the information out of it. And he really knew the sources to do the interplay. So, for instance, and this gets into book three a little bit uh, of Hrushevsky, but. Um, the way that he talks about the relationship between the Hungarians, the Poles, and uh, uh, Halic, right, um, is intricate. And it, this is a complicated period in the 13th century, and yet it's as if he is very clear who these actors are as individuals, what their roles and motivations were, and sometimes I didn't necessarily agree, but they were fully formed individuals in his mind. And he could then demonstrate why they were acting the way they were acting and interacting. And you know, one of the comments I get about my own work is um, it's impressive that that Raffensperger can keep these uh, similarly named figures separate, right? But uh, I read about these people in the sources, and they be, they come alive. And I saw that same thing in Hrushevsky to an even greater extent. Um, and it wasn't just for the 11th century or early 12th century. He's doing this over a much wider range of time. And so that was something that I continually found to be impressive. So in the 11th century, we see a whole lot of change coming, and, and part of it comes with the introduction of Christianity. Uh, and so we see the introduction of new churches being built, and so there's a St. Sophia in Kiev, there's a St. Sophia in Novgorod, um, and those are going to be ecclesiastical centers. Uh, we will see ecclesiastical writing come in, and I know you mentioned speaking with Sean Griffin about the liturgy. Um, so we will see some ecclesiastical writing come in both from Constantinople, but even more so from Bulgaria. Um, we will see uh, the law codes um, grow and change. And so the Ruskaya Pravda of Yaroslav is, is quite simple, right? And it's largely about property law and um, people, right? So wergeld, a man price. But then the Pravda of Yaroslav's sons expands it enormously to deal with other crimes and the Pravda of Yaroslav's sons shows us that there is, in fact, a 
uh, nascent bureaucracy, right? And that maybe overstates it a bit. But if you read the Povas Vrem Nikliat, you've got Kenyas doing this, another Kenyas doing that. Um, but you don't ever see the uh, bailiff uh, or the blood white collector, right? But if you then look in the Ruskaya Pravda, you see these little individuals who are tools of the government. They're tools of the king who are actors. And so all of that is developed in the 11th century. Um, we will see Kiev itself grow. Um, we, it grows from, so it's a city on, on hills above the Dnieper. so it grows from uh, Vladimir's city to Yaroslav's city, which is a much larger expansion. Um, the walls are built in stone, new churches are built, the Padol, the market area along the Dnieper expands. Uh, we have trading caravans coming uh, from the west. Uh, there's a Polish gate, a Hungarian gate. Um, there, this is where these these caravans are coming in. It's not just that north-south Dnieper trade. So there's so much change uh, that's going on in Russian society in the 11th century, and this is one of the reasons why it's talked about as the golden age. At the elite level, right? You asked about intelligentsia. That you also see the changes at court because uh, we have women coming in who are from other places, and so we've got uh, Polish Princess Gertrude, for instance, who marries Izislav, and she brings with her uh, an entourage that we don't know very much about, but we do see changes, for instance, in illumination styles and manuscripts that are going on in Kiev at that time that are clearly utilizing Western styles. Um, and, and we know some of this because she has her own Psalter that then goes back uh, to the German Empire later, and so we have it preserved. And so we've got Western style illuminations, we've got uh, Slavic letters um, in uh, in conjunction. I, I just would like to reiterate, because I think I've said this before, but this is still scholarship that um, should be read. Uh, and it should be read by people not just working on Ukraine or Ukrainian studies. Um, this is not a vanity project. This is not a pro-Ukraine project. Um, this is a project to bring a really interesting scholarly work um, into the 21st century, into the Anglophone world, in an acknowledgement that um, the scholarly world, the international scholarly world, is becoming increasingly Anglophone. Um, and we see this too with Russian studies. Um, there is a, a it's hard to imagine a growing divide since the Soviet Union, but there is still a divide between um, Russian studies in Russian and Russian studies in English, right? In the 90s, they thought this was going to be bridged and, and, and we won't have to worry about it. Um, but it is very much still a divide and perhaps uh, potentially even growing. And so this is a scholarly project that is still relevant for scholars today, both scholars working on medieval Rus, as well as working on the historiography of 19th and early 20th century um, scholarship. Yeah, what I certainly have thought so many times, what if, you know, what if Hrushevsky had been translated to English in 1911? Um, how would that have affected the progress of scholarly development? Um, you know, would there even have been a scholarly need for, for work like my own reimagining Europe? Or would he, uh, simply by dint of the translation, have changed the entire way we look at that scholarly world in medieval Eastern Europe? Thanks for reaching out, Will. I, I appreciate being able to talk about these things with uh, with you. Great. Thank you so much. Have a great day.